Thanks, Adam. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's really special and humbling and exciting. Um, I hope we can all chit chat or say hi afterwards. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to show uh, a bunch of work tonight from a long period of time. Um, tend to make these things pretty slowly and they're pretty short and small in their scale. So it kind of makes sense to watch seven or eight of them cramped together. Um, and, you know, this is really the first time showing in LA where I've been living for so long, the first time doing a program, a solo program. Um, I think one of the things that's so exciting about living here and making creative work here is that, you know, it's such a rich artistic community. And, um, you know, even though there's not really extensive credits on a lot of these films, I would wager to guess that probably 80% of you here helped in some way on one of these projects or another. And, you know, they were always imagined to be shown in group screenings, kind of in conversation with other films or other works. So um, it'll be interesting to watch them removed from that and kind of just all, all of one piece. But um, yeah, really excited that we can do that together tonight. Um, Thanks so much to Adam and Fumpform for having me. Thanks to Mark Toscano for projecting and putting together the sequencing of the program tonight, and for Zena to helping with the sound and the other tech. Um, yeah, and we will have a little, a brief, but hopefully interesting conversation afterwards. So I don't think I have much to say besides that. So thanks again, and I'm really, really excited to be here with you all. Like Stoltz. <laughs> So that was um, a 61-minute program. It's like a beautiful length, actually, right? I mean, because there's, there's a lot going on in there, right? We talked about this, like, how long a show should be, right? And, like, because you curate as well, and I know you favor shorter programs. But um, uh, I, I wanted to actually talk about music and sound, because you, I mean, you were involved in music, and you're, I mean, a long-time musician in bands, music lover. I assume before you got into filmmaking. And so, but I can't help but feel like that influences your approach to, to film in terms of your consciousness around time and texture and everything. And I don't know, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us about like your interchange between music, sound, film? Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone. Um, thank um, yeah, I mean, I, I think like, many people that end up making film and video it's rare that it's sort of your first go at doing something creative you know usually people come to it from other disciplines i guess you would say um but i think like a lot of people my age my demographic i was sort of around in that like suburban american underground music explosion 90s and early 2000s where you know, it wasn't quite, there was a guitar center in every town or a girls rock camp, but it was like moving towards that way. So all of subculture got funneled into music and all of, you know, no one would call themselves an artist. That would be crazy, but everyone was a musician, right? Um, and so that was definitely my window in my way of thinking, you know, and then kind of the culture around that, making records, making tapes, um, zines were a big part of it too, you know, these you would have like a 45 second song or a 30 page zine. And it wasn't like these things were more efficient or economical, but because they were abbreviated, you had these weird jumps in time where it almost became like pure juxtaposition and thought and um, just understanding, you know? Um, so that, you know, when I started seeing films and videos that I appreciated as opposed to Titanic or whatever, which seemed cool, but just kind of like wallpaper. Um, you know, I, th I thought about, um, especially like being introduced to the 16 millimeter film projector and that strip of plastic going through it. You know, it was an amazing container for images, but also sound and, the, and silence too, the way that grooves of a record, you know, even if it was dead wax, you knew there was something coming next and that kind of anticipation and also the way the wheels of the projector seem to be going 
100 miles an hour, even if the film was very slow and still. And, and you know, that felt really akin to like magnetic tape and compact disc and vinyl record. Um, and then also making the thing, like if you made a seven inch record, whether you liked it or not, you're sort of in this uh, industrial collaboration with like United Records in Nashville, Tennessee, who maybe they just got done making like a Leanne Rhymes record or something. And all of a sudden you're giving them this like terribly recorded four track cassette. And you're like, no, make, make the drums punch here, you know, and it's sort of like arguing with them. And that, that carried over into like the many trips to photo chem later on being like, I know, uh, you know, I know it's, uh, you know, it's not balanced for daylight, but can we make it less blue, you know, kind of thing? <laughs> Just like sort of arguing for things that you felt very strongly about, but technically were improper. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the funny thing about film. And I mean, you know, because I'm a film archivist, I think about this a lot looking at the film strip. And I feel like you're somebody who really pays attention to this sort of sculptural, like architectural aspects of the film strip. It's this physical space that has discrete frames and it has this like analog soundtrack. And you can like look at it as an object and then you put it on a projector and it becomes this experience. But your films all seem to be so attuned to both dimensions of, of cinema that as it's like a, a physical thing and an ephemeral, temporal experience. Um, and so I was thinking tonight, like watching these kind of back to back, you work in a lot of different modes, but you, there's almost this like sculptural sense too, because you're really concerned with space and spaces. And I was wondering if, especially with regard to the new film, holographic will. You said it's kind of an accidental pandemic movie or quarantine movie almost. I think when we were talking on the phone about it and like, but this um, interest in space and uh, like so many of the films are about space and like our awareness of space. And so, yeah, could you tell us something about that interest? Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, I think when I started picking up video camera and film camera, um, you know, especially when you're looking through a viewfinder, it already feels like you're sort of in a cave or something like that, as opposed to looking at a monitor or looking at like, you know, the screen on your cell phone when you're recording video. So there was sort of that like tunnel thing happening. And, you know, I, I feel like as a way to kind of, you know, rather than working with, I mean, there's some films with performers or things like that, but rather than working with characters, it felt like just making the space behind the camera so you know so much about the body and the limits of the body and working with the camera and the body together um that became really interesting and still is really interesting to me and sort of like the go-to mode um and then yeah i think a lot of these you know i think of these films as landscape films in a way but also architectural films and you know i think in a lot of them you see it's like uh the man-made environment and the natural environment are sort of like not at odds with one another, but sort of like competing in this way and sort of like pushing back on one another. And, you know, that's really like my experience of moving through the world is it feels like if you don't, if you don't trim those vines back, it's going to be just a matter of time before the building gets overtaken. Um, and there's something really exciting about that. Um, but yeah, just, and, and yeah, I think the space of the film and the video frame is really interesting. Also, the space between frames and kind of the frame line and, you know, inserting darkness or black and sort of feeling like rather than just that being a placeholder, you're stretching out the space between frames in this way. And, you know, sometimes it's very fast, sometimes it's very generous and very long. Um, but yeah, thinking about not only the object of like a video file or a film reel, but thinking about kind of the experience of watching films becomes very object-like and almost hyper object, you know, when it starts to become bigger than the screen or pop off the screen because of strobing or fast movement or something like that. Well, and then on the subject of space too, I wanted to ask you about Florida because Florida plays, I think, a really interesting role in it. I mean, the two of the films very obviously but um, it's two of the most kind of unusual films in the program, too. You have Under the Atmosphere and then earlier Half Human, Half Vapor. Half Human, Half Vapor in particular, I remember seeing that for the first time and being like, wow, Florida's a strange place. I want to, <laughs> like, I feel like I'm getting a certain view into it through your, what you're interested in and you having spent a lot of time to, you know, growing up there and going to school there and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, could, what, so what's the story with Florida and these films in particular? 
Well, it's a huge state. I don't know if I could summarize it. But yeah, I'm a Florida person through and through, born and raised. You know, I was spent a lot of my 20s like traveling, playing in bands, but it didn't occur to me that I could move out of Florida. So I lived there for the first 25 years of my life and tried all these different, I don't know, I felt really bound by the, the state lines for some reason. You know, there's no good reason for that. Um, but especially moving here and getting more active with making films, having graduate school and access to resources and you know being in a place where tons of filmmakers live and you can kind of trade tips and tricks um you know i had all this physical distance i hadn't lived there in a long time and i think i was starting to go back and visit and kind of reconnect with family in this way yeah it just felt i think having grown up there i felt like i had agency to like just move through the world with a camera in a way that you don't always feel in every place um but also yeah, it just felt, you know, removing people from these landscapes and kind of thinking about thinking about it as a place just filled with these relics, um, even though they're not that old, you know, like half human, half vapor, you see these sort of like bastardized sculpture forms of mixing together all these cultural images, including like almost like a mannequin from a department store at one point, you know, um, and then with the space program stuff, um, you know, it just felt like the landscape had been so annihilated and sculpted around that. And even growing up right next to that, um, you know, there was this kind of narrative around the history that like it was a place without history before technology arrived, even though that's not true. But, you know, people will tell you things like, well, you know, no one lived here until the 1960s, <laughs> you know, and it's just ridiculous. Um, but it had really been wiped clean in this way and just felt like um, cinder block houses, ranch style houses. and. Uh, launch pads and things like that. So it, you know, I felt like moving through that space with a camera was a way to kind of bring these still objects and remnants to life. Well, and also you alluded to this when you introduced the program, but you said something to the effect of how these films, in a sense, were designed or expected to be shown in juxtaposition with like other people's films and like festival programs and mixed programs and I mean I'm really curious what it was like to see all these together you're kind of looking at like a dozen plus years of your your creative output as a filmmaker and like I don't know how because you, you mentioned you're kind of interested to see how that would feel yeah. and like, you, would you care to share with us like how, how that felt was it like watching was it like an episode of this is your life Mike Stoltz or something <laughs> yes uh yeah I mean also like who who was that person that made that was making that stuff in 2013, 2014? Um, but yeah, no, I mean it's part of why I was excited about the opportunity to do this is to um, think about where those three lines are because I think every project, when I make it, you know, it always feels like even if it's like a five-minute film, it takes so much time to finish it, and that kind of industrial collaboration, you know, working, handing it off to a lab and things like that, and then trying to figure out where it will show in the world. You know, it's just all this waiting and downtime and your your brain's in a totally different place by the time you're working on the next project. So a lot of ways it feels like each project is sort of a reaction to the next one or almost like, well, never again, you know, like <laughs> instead. Um, but, you know, especially in the last couple of years, I think, you know, some of the more technique based stuff, the more like pinwheel stuff, I've been really excited to come back to and think about what it means to me at, this time of my life versus what it did 10 years ago or you know 12 years ago 15 years ago um so yeah seeing them all together is uh i mean yeah i don't know i'm, I'm really interested in the frame i'm like flirting with the idea of putting people on screen but not really um but also yeah this idea of image a container for image and sound and these things that have become really active on screen and yeah just kind of the um like stimulant quality of film, the way that uh, if things start moving really fast, you know, it's not, it's sort of the opposite of a drone or something like that. Um, it's almost like you need to watch every frame and you're sort of feeling every cut and every moment. And there's, that's endlessly exciting to me, you know, almost regardless of what's happening on screen, the way that it's moving through time and space. Um, that's kind of what keeps me coming back. I think the way that you use 16 millimeter, it's like you're really conscious of that 
the physicality, the kineticism, and like it was really special, I think, to see them in a theater tonight, like a lot of people. And um, something to touch is a piece that you made like right. What you finished in like early 2020, right? Yeah. It was and so then it kind of didn't have a chance to like have a theatrical yeah. life. So and I first saw, I mean, I saw it online, which it seems like a singularly inappropriate way to see that piece. That's the one that had a lot of intermittent flicker and like the you know window shots and stuff. And um, I don't know, that was just fantastic to see tonight. And I was wondering, um, as something that you only had a chance really to show kind of online and maybe remotely, like what, what did that live up? your theatrical experience of it yourself <laughs> to your expectations and hopes um yes uh <laughs> no i yeah i mean that piece is especially tough it's sort of like the bluesiest piece of the of, of anything i made you know it just kind of like uh but you know it's very like true to where i was at when i made it and that's you know it felt important to work through some ideas to make it um around like having a family member incarcerated at the time and just kind of like the furtiveness or helplessness of that. Um, but yeah, so it was hard. You know, I think when I was done with it, it felt like it was almost like sometimes you make stuff to sort of process some feelings and it was, yeah, it was pandemic. I mean, I'm grateful that it got to screen all these places, but it was like these kind of glitchy Vimeo streams and like, okay, here's a really challenging flicker film with like, a really distorted kind of like wild oscillator. You know, it just felt like no one, no one's gonna want to watch this on their iPad, like while they're work, while they're like bleaching their groceries. You know, and, uh, wondering if they're gonna like ever see their grandmother again. Um, you know, it just like I get that. So it felt really hard to like advocate for it, and also um, I think I was not interested in like sitting in it. Um, but yeah, there is one film print of it. It did. Yeah, it has played in like Tokyo and France, you know, just because friends there were interested in showing it and maybe like pandemic regulations were different. Um, but it was great to watch it here with people together. And, you know, it still is all those things. It's challenging, it's difficult, it's like a little sad. Um, but, you know, it really was designed to be watched in this environment, I think, as all these things were. So, uh, yeah, glad. Thanks for watching, I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Mr. Mike here. Yes. Um, hey, Mike. Hi. And can you talk about what drew you to that first, um, like with pluses and minuses, what drew you to that aperture wall and your process yeah. around that? It seems like it, you've woven it throughout the years, and I'd love to hear more about your process. What helps you with that? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I uh, I think in general, like, you know, again, kind of like being real about the space behind the camera and the person behind the camera and the body that I moved through the world in, um, you know, the architecture became so important in that kind of framing and like looking through things. Um, and you know, the very, very first film I ever made was In Between, which we showed tonight, which is kind of that brick wall with the openings in it. And, you know, I like the idea of apertures or openings. It's got this photographic resonance, but also openings feel like possibilities or the unknown or, you know, um, just kind of these opportunities for discovery or rupture. But I was looking at these things and they're usually called privacy walls, you know, so they're these giant brick walls that you couldn't walk through, you can't pass to the other side, you can't drive a car through it, but it's got these openings to let light and sound and wind through, and they just feel so ridiculous, and once you sort of see them, you can't unsee them. You know, they really, especially in a place like Southern California or anywhere with lots of strip malls and office parks, they sort of surround us. Um, so thinking about a way to move them around and, and focus more on what's beyond them than kind of the thing that's keeping you from moving forward. That, you know, that became a really rich idea in addition to kind of the kaleidoscopic thing that happens when you shoot one frame with the camera at one angle, then turn it upside down and take another frame and over and over, you know, hours later you have like 30 seconds of footage. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah.
Yeah, uh, yeah. I've had, I've had some people tell me they wanted to hum along. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and you, yeah, totally, yeah, like the the bouncing ball with the lyrics at the bottom. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, no, I mean that that's you know a very old piece now, but it was really fun to make um, with Sylvia, who's also a filmmaker, who probably a lot of people know. Um, you know, it's very like grad school. Like we were sort of doing trading off doing portraits of one another and this was the port but I was really into um you know like Richard Serra and Nancy Holt boomerang and sort of this idea of um prediction and kind of anticipation so you know I'm right behind the video camera with the bass guitar playing, you know and the only prompt was like let's try to follow one another let's try to predict where it will go and it's really only a couple notes and um but yeah it was fun you know like playing Playing music with other people is like hands down one of the most magical things that anyone can do, even if you don't know how to play music, you know, just making sound together. So trying to, um, you know, it's really hard to capture that on film or video. So this was sort of an attempt at that. I mean, you see other attempts in other films too. Um, but yeah, kind of filling in that space behind the camera, filling in that off-screen space. And also just that was filmed in Newhall and with one microphone and, you know, just Southern California in general is so, like once you're listening to the landscape through a microphone, it just sounds like there's a semi-truck's gonna drive through your wall at any time. <laughs> you know, so just that kind of roar of, the, the, not even a highway, just a road, but you know, it's just like tons of delivery trucks going down at all hours and, um, you know, but then also things like the wind chimes and the birds and stuff. Um, you wouldn't think of it, but once you sort of put the headphones on, you're like, wow, this is a really rich soundscape on its own, you know, to put some kind of very crude music performance in that um, was, was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about the uh, watching, watching all of your films together, there's some sort of sense of like a hypnotic sense to all of your work, how camera moves, of the soundscape is uh, is that is that something you think about uh, while you make your work, like this kind of hypnotic sense that you want to deliver to the audience, or is it just something that is kind of natural that comes out of the work? And so, how do you approach it? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, I definitely think about. Although I think someone who's really first and familiar with trance would not call these trance pieces, but but I think about this like the way, especially time-based media, you know, recorded sound, recorded image can can kind of take you there. Yeah, it can kind of be a kind of hypnosis or sort of take you out of your body. And I, you know, in everything I've ever made, you know, whether it's writing or music or whatever, uh, that's been the goal. I feel like it's a lot more possible in film and video with the moving image. Um, I don't know why that is. I think because, especially because the combination of image and sound can be so kind of, um, you can sort of fall into it more easily. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's definitely, definitely the goal. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that was like a conscious thing. You know, I, I think when I first started experimenting with video and film, it became apparent really quickly that that could happen the way that like, you know, the best Black Sabbath songs start one way and then all of a sudden, wait, whoa, we're in a whirlpool, you know, like how do we get here in four minutes? Um, you know, that, that was sort of, it, it became apparent that, like again, this idea of sort of um, collapsing time and, and jumping through these things that would feel like pure juxtaposition, but all of a sudden they're, they're linked because they're in the same piece or the same container. I hope that one helps. <laughs> uh, I was curious about the 
pre uh, reveal when a certain subject is completely abstracted and totally spinning into a room or a fence or an area or an object and how much we get to know what it is or don't get to know. And uh, in each film, I wonder if for you that's about portraiture or the process or just showing us the level of abstraction that they become a material to play with. Occasionally combine it with the graphics to converse. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I mean, it, it, yeah, I, hmm, how do I put it? Uh, you know, something about the frame, especially the 16 millimeter frame, where it's almost like a cyclops, you know, it's like this square and it's like, you know, the opposite of like watching something on your phone or like, you know, widescreen. Um, uh, there's something really compelling about that and the, you know, pointing the camera and focusing on one thing or one action, you're very much like editing out the entire world except for that, you know, so sort of, um, you know, and besides having something like a horizon line or whatever, you can it's hard to even, you can really remove things from their environment in that way. And um, that idea is visually like really compelling to me. And, um, you know, in different pieces, it sort of pushes farther, you know, it goes in tighter and tighter and you just see, you know, a hint of a gesture or a hint of a location and other places trying to zoom out a little bit more and have a little bit more visual context. Um, but I guess to answer your question, it's sort of both, you know, it's sort of like portraiture and abstraction and kind of having, try, you know, an attempt to have both those things happen in the same frame or in the same piece. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming out and watching this stuff. Um, really, really special to have you out here.